are delighted to be speaking with Dr. Roger E. Olson. Roger Olson is professor of theology at the George W. Truett Theological Seminary in Texas. He is the author of many scholarly books, including The Journey of Modern Theology, Arminian Theology, Myths and Realities, and also the book that we'll be discussing today, The Mosaic of Christian Belief, 20 Centuries of Unity and Diversity, now available in its second edition. Professor Olson, thank you for being with us today. You're welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Professor Olson, I understand that this book has come out of many years of teaching. What are some of the foundational classes that you've been teaching into which, uh, from which you've poured the information in this book? So I began teaching Christian theology, primarily historical theology, but sometimes systematic theology, in 1984. And I've been teaching it every semester since, except when I was on sabbatical. For the first approximately 15 years or so, I used many different one-volume handbooks of theology. I won't name them, but many. And I was never quite satisfied with them. Uh, I found myself adding material to them and skipping chapters and all kinds of things. So I decided finally to write my own based on lectures that I was giving in those courses. And that's how this book came to be, The Mosaic of Christian Belief, 20 Centuries of Unity and Diversity. So it really is just out of my own lectures in Christian doctrine and theology. Excellent. In the introduction to this text, you explain that the aim of this book is to articulate a, quote, both-and theology rather than an either-or theology. And you observe, if, again, I can quote you, part of the process of Christian maturation is recognizing legitimate diversity and even disagreement within larger unity and agreement, unquote. How does one recognize this legitimate diversity, and when can we speak of illegitimate departure from the Christian tradition? Yeah, I hope I make that clear in the book, that for me that has to do with the Bible and the Christian consensus. Those are the two primary um, criteria that I use. Of course, both of those have to do with Jesus Christ. For me, Christology is the center. And so uh, I interpret the Bible through Jesus Christ, and I look for uh, how Jesus Christ is treated in Christian history uh, by different theologians. And to me, the line between orthodoxy and heresy has to do with the person of Jesus Christ primarily, although there are other ways in which individuals and groups can stray away from Christian orthodoxy into heresy. But for me, the touchstone or the main one, anyway, is Jesus Christ himself as God and man, the doctrine of the Incarnation, or I would prefer to say the event of the Incarnation. So I, I treat in the book, uh, of course, the Bible. I begin every chapter with the, the question, the issue that this doctrine is about, and why we need a doctrine about this topic, uh, kind of how it developed. And then I go into the biblical basis for the orthodox doctrine of it, and then the Christian consensus, early church fathers, uh, reformers, those two mainly, sometimes people in between, medieval theologians I touch on sometimes, sometimes more modern or at least post-modern, post-Reformation theologians, such as Wesley and Edwards and so forth. But I look for what have the, the leading Christian thinkers throughout the centuries agreed on. Uh, about the meaning of the Bible and about uh, who God is and the nature of God and, and who Jesus Christ is and how we are saved and things like that. So I call it the great tradition or the Christian consensus. And, you know, I, I make it clear that that's not as authoritative as the Bible, that the Christian consensus can theoretically be wrong if it falls into conflict with the Bible, that it always needs to be retested in light of scripture as God's inspired word. Uh, but that's in theory. I, I really believe, and I say this in the book, that God has maintained the church in truth. Even through the most difficult periods of time, there have been people that we can discover who held to true Christian doctrine and biblical faith. So I, I look at it both biblically and historically, uh, and it being Christian truth. Now, how, how do I recognize when a group or an individual goes f too far astray into what I would call heresy or false doctrine, and I treat some of those in every chapter too, 
uh, where are those beliefs that we as Christians should not consider biblical and orthodox? And again, the, the test for me has to do with uh, the Bible, Christian, the great Christian tradition, and especially the person of Jesus Christ. And when a group strays too far away from the Bible, uh, taken as God's inspired word and the Christian consensus, then I'm inclined to say it's probably not something we as Christians want to believe. We don't want to trust them if they're too far away from that. Thank you for that response. Um, Dr. Olson, of course, you are very aware of the problem of the so-called hermeneutical circle, and I'm just wondering how you resolve that in your own theological method. For our viewers' sake, a the, the problem of the hermeneutical circle is that we found our faith in Jesus Christ, but we receive our understanding of Jesus Christ through the text. So mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we understand and, and correct as necessary the lens through which we're reading the Scripture? Yeah. Well, uh, that's not an easy question to answer, of course. Uh, theologians have wrestled with that for a very long time, and I don't have any magical answer to it. Um, I, I am basically a pietist. I believe that I have, and we should all as Christians have, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and hear his voice speaking to us, what Bruner called the master's voice speaking to us through Scripture. Scripture is self-authenticating in the sense that we meet our Savior, Jesus Christ, in its pages. And he is really the one who authenticates it to us as we meet him there, as we come into encounter with him through Scripture. So I tell people uh, who care to listen and hear what I have to say that I don't believe in Jesus because of the Bible. I believe in the Bible because of Jesus. And yet, of course, I only meet Jesus through the words of scripture, in terms of knowing who he was. But there is something contemporary about Jesus Christ, too. Uh, I don't believe that he is, uh, it, it's, he's, he's only a historical figure that we read about in the Gospels, for example. I believe that he encounters us through scripture as we read and study it, and as we hear it proclaimed, as we prayerfully read it, that we come into this uh, encounter with the living Jesus Christ. He's not just a figure of the past, but he is a living person. Dr. Olson, uh, is there a particular Christian doctrine that displays the so-called both-and character of Christian theology in a, pra in a paradigmatic fashion? That is, the doctrine of the Trinity, for example, teaches that God is both one and three. The doctrine of Christology teaches us that Jesus is both God and man. And it seems that we're taking these ideas and, and overlaying them on other Christian teachings concerning the scriptures, that they are, there's a divine and a human element, or the church, that there's an invisible and invisible element, the kingdom of God as already here but not yet. Uh, is there a paradigmatic doctrine in which we experience this both-and character of Christian theology? Well, I would say all of those are paradigmatic. Um, there's no one of them that is a, that stands out from the others as more paradigmatic than the rest, unless it would perhaps be Jesus Christ, who I've already said is the center of it all, that he is both God and man. And the early church wrestled with this for centuries. And of course, there was a tendency among early Christians to either exalt his humanity to the exclusive exclusion of his divinity, such as in adoptionism, the belief that he was just a man who was adopted by God as his son, a special prophet, uh, or there was a tendency to emphasize the divinity, as the Gnostics did, although I don't think they believed in the full divinity as we do, but there was a tendency to emphasize the spiritual nature of Jesus Christ to the exclusion of his humanity. It's called docetism. And so you see extremes there, and of course the church eventually decided that what it had always believed when it was right, was that he is both fully, truly God and fully, truly man. Um, so that would be paradigmatic, I guess. But all the other examples you gave and all the chapters in the book are, are examples of it, such as the kingdom of God is already, but not yet. And so in every case, I think we see uh, that where, where there can be both and among Christians, but that doesn't mean every um, duality of belief is a case of both and. There are cases where it's either or, and I point that out in the book. Very good. 
Dr. Olson, in your book, you discuss a theology of revelation in chapters 3 and 4, preceding your discussion of the doctrine of God in chapters 5 and 6. What is the significance of placing your reflection on the nature of revelation prior to your reflection on the nature of God? I would say that that's primarily a matter of strategy, and that's because we, in the modern West especially, are kind of obsessed with epistemology, knowledge. We always ask about the foundations and how do we know things. If it were up to me, I would begin with Jesus Christ. But, of course, then the modern Western mind, even conservative Christians are influenced by that, always want to know, uh, how do we know? And so we begin with revelation, usually. It's just normal to begin with revelation in systematic theology, uh, unless it even begins with what's called prolegomena, which would be reason and faith, questions of reason and faith. But again, that has to do with epistemology. So basically, it's just a matter of strategy. It's laying the foundation and saying, here's the, here's the source of our knowledge of the rest of what's in the book, as opposed to some other source, you know, some People who call themselves Christians would turn to what Schleiermacher, the father of liberal theology, called God consciousness. Um, I want to make clear in the book that our source and norm as Christians in theology is revelation. And by that, I mean God's revelation of himself to us, not uh, our search for God and somehow coming up with answers on our own. But it's from God. Very good. In chapter 9, a chapter entitled Humanity, Essentially Good and Essentially Estranged, you predicate the goodness of human nature, and obviously this goes quite against the Calvinist teaching on the doctrine of total depravity. From your perspective, what are the strongest arguments for uh, holding to this continued essential goodness in human nature? Yeah. Um, you know, I think I disagree with you about Calvinism there. I think that Calvin himself and the very best of Calvinism, though it, it believes in total depravity, and so do I, by the way, never denied the goodness of human nature itself. So the reason for that is the image of God. Every human being is created in God's own image and likeness. Now that image and likeness are damaged by the fall. We are damaged goods, I say, um, but we're still good in the sense that God uh, looks upon us as created in his image and likeness. Now, to me, total depravity means, the total of total depravity means every part of us is broken by sin. Uh, that's in contrast to the Catholic doctrine that uh, sin does not really break our, reasonal, our reasoning ability to know something about God truly apart from revelation. So the Protestant reformers talked about total depravity, and we all, I think, believe in that, that every aspect of us is, is affected by sin. There's no part of humanity, no aspect or dimension of humanity that isn't broken by sin. That's the total in total depravity. So I say that even as a non-Calvinist, I believe in total depravity. Uh, no one can even reach out to God without the help of grace. That's total depravity. We're helpless. We're dead in trespasses and sins. There can, there's nothing we can do um, that would connect us with God truly without the help of grace. And uh, Dr. Olson, this is a fascinating point you're making. Would you be willing to expound on that? How does a doctrine of, I, I understand that you are a self-identifying Arminian theologian. So yes. I take it as quite interesting that you hold to the doctrine of total depravity, of course, primarily exposited as a Calvinist teaching, where does the doctrine of total depravity situate itself in your own theology, and is there are there yet uh, parts of that that need resolution, or does total depravity fit just fine in, a, in an Arminian viewpoint? Well, Arminius himself believed in it. Um, that's clear. Uh, I have no doubt about that, and I demonstrate that in Arminian theology, myths, and realities. I have a whole chapter on humanity in Arminian theology, and all classical Arminians have believed in the way I just described total depravity, our total and utter dependence on grace for any true knowledge of God. Now, even Calvin believed in a census divinus, that is, that every human being knows somewhere deep within themselves that there is a God, but they cannot come to a 
true knowledge of God without divine grace and revelation. He said, and I agree, as an Arminian, the human mind is nothing but a factory of idols, apart from grace. However, I think the difference is that Arminians, and I agree with Arminius and the classical Arminian tradition here, believes that, that God's prevenient grace can heal that brokenness of total depravity to the extent that we are then able, because of God's prevenient grace, to accept uh, his salvation. Uh, but that he doesn't select certain ones to be saved and exclude others. So that's where we differ. We don't differ on total depravity or not. If total depravity means the human mind is nothing but a factory of idols apart from grace, then I certainly endorse that, and so do all classical Arminians that I know, and I, I show that in the book. Professor Olson, in chapter 13 of your text, chapter entitled The Church, Visible and Invisible, you include a discussion about the sacraments. Of course, it's the disagreement over the sacraments that caused the original splintering of the Reformation movement, uh, exemplified in the 1529 Marlborough Colloquy. Uh, in your view, is there hope that Protestants could achieve agreement in the future concerning the nature of the sacraments? Yeah. So I've studied that event quite a bit, and I'll have to say that I think both contenders, Luther and Zwingli, were obstinate and unwilling to listen to each other. And at his best, um, Luther was simply saying there is a real presence of Christ here in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And at his best, Zwingli was simply saying it's not a means of special grace. So what I say to my students is if we could just agree, I mean as Protestants, if Protestants could just agree that the Lord's Supper is a special means of grace, but not a means of special grace, perhaps we would find unity in that. Now, there would still be other differences to overcome, but as you say, that was what kept them apart in the beginning, unless the issues were really deeper than that and had to do with <laughs> each one claiming that he was the real founder of the Reformation. And I suspect that had a lot to do with it, pride, in other words. So I think what keeps us apart a lot is just pride in our particularities, and we just don't want to give those up. And <laughs> but, but to me, and this might actually be a question you're headed toward, let me answer it now, uh, and that is that the unity, our unity in Christ is a spiritual unity, and I don't particularly care about the fact that we have different denominational names and traditions and organizational structures. To me, the issue of unity is can we gather around the Lord's table together and, and share in communion together? And that's where I see unity. We may never agree until the kingdom comes about the right form of church government or the details of the Lord's Supper or things like that. But I think we can and hopefully are increasingly agreeing about our, our unity in Christ. And I would not go to a church that had closed communion for that reason. I think it's sectarian and it breaks the unity of the body of Christ to close communion except to non-Christians, of course. But anyone who embraces Christ as Savior and Lord and really means that, that he is God and Savior, I think needs to be welcomed to the table. Dr. Olson, are there any movements within Protestantism or within the broader church that you see as hopeful concerning ecumenical progress? Mm. You know, I grew up in a time when the charismatic movement and the Jesus people movement were very strong and able to bridge a lot of the gaps between Protestants and even between Protestants and Catholics. And that was a very heady time in the 70s. Uh, when we, we did worship together in spirit and in truth, although we disagreed on some things, of course, and some important things, but we still could worship together. I think we live more in a time now of separation, of tribalism, of what some have called the balkanize balkanization of Christianity. Um, I don't see a lot of hope right now in in what's happening, but I do have hope in the Holy Spirit and the future. So I hope that we can, in the future, rediscover that spirit of unity. Um, but there isn't much happening right now. 
Dr. Olson, if I can ask a concluding question, it's a question we've been asking all of our speakers on this program, and that is this. What would it mean for the church today to be united? How can we recognize this unity, and what can we do as individual Christians to pursue the unity of the church? Well, that goes back to the answer that I gave just a moment ago, and that is, for me, unity is found in the Lord's Supper and in common worship together. And I visit many churches of many different denominational kinds and find Christian unity there in spite of the fact that we may not agree about things like predestination or something. Uh, I recently visited a Presbyterian church in America. One of my students was the pastor of it, and I had no problem worshiping with them and uh, found wonderful unity of spirit with them. They're very evangelical, as I believe that I am. And uh, I have even been to Catholic churches, primarily charismatic Catholic churches, where I felt a real unity of spirit. So I think that the unity is in the Holy Spirit and is visible in common shared communion. And that's what I hope for. Hmm. And Dr. Olson, would you be willing to connect those things explicitly for me? I think I've heard two things. The unity is found in the Lord's Supper. The unity is found in the Holy Spirit. But in the Lord's Supper, the Holy Spirit is made visible. Can you articulate uh, how is it that the Holy Spirit relates to the unity of yeah. experienced in the Lord's Supper? What I meant to say was that the Lord's Supper becomes, for me anyway, the visible sign of the unity of the Spirit. So when we talk about our being unified in the Holy Spirit, in spirit and in truth, how does that show? Where, where is that demonstrated? And for me, what I look for is, uh, are all true Christians welcome to the Lord's table? And they are at my church. And I would hope that all Christians would eventually come to that and stop closing the Lord's table to people who don't belong to their church or their denomination just because of that. But unfortunately, there still are Protestant churches and, of course, the Catholic Church uh, and Eastern Orthodox that do not welcome non-Catholics, non-Eastern Orthodox or non-members of the, their Protestant denomination to the Lord's table. I hope that someday we can overcome that, and that will be a great sign to me of real unity. I don't really care particularly about institutional and visible unity, such as the ecumenical movement talked about. Um, I think that maybe the fact that there are 200 denominations of real Christians in the United States isn't in and of itself a bad thing. Thank you so much for those very fruitful responses. It's been our pleasure today to be speaking with Dr. Roger Olson, professor of theology at George W. Truett Theological Seminary in Texas, and also author of the text we've been discussing today, The Mosaic of Christian Belief, 20 Centuries of Unity and Diversity, now available in its second edition. Dr. Olson, thank you for your responses. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. 